Hello everybody, this is another talk um, for the acute medicine students. Uh, this topic is uh, functional gastrointestinal disorders. Uh, on your curriculum, this covers acute core conditions uh, number 11. My name is James Piper, I'm a clinical teaching fellow and I've been uh, developing this series on YouTube. So recognising functional disorders. So this can be quite tricky. Um, I think as doctors, particularly us as acute physicians, we tend to uh, rely on investigations a lot. Um, we often sometimes feel quite uncomfortable um, sending patients home, uh, particularly, for example, if they have GI symptoms without, say, arranging a colonoscopy or sigmoidoscopy. Uh, previously, irritable bowel syndrome, which is what I'm going to focus on today, um, what used to be a diagnosis of exclusion, i.e. the patient would have numerous tests, uh, including inv uh, possibly invasive endoscopy tests, uh, before we'd make that diagnosis. Now it's the other way around, where we try and make sure that we're not missing any red flag symptoms um, to avoid unnecessary uh, burden of testing. So generally speaking, functional disorders are those that have an absence of identifiable and anatomical or physiological disease in patients with typical gastrointestinal symptoms. Uh, even though uh, about half of those who are seen by my colleagues in gastroenterology uh, in secondary care are diagnosed with a functional GI disorder. Uh, we will focus on irritable bowel syndrome. Um, I have suggested a reference text towards the end which gives quite a good chapter on functional dyspepsia. I will cover functional dyspepsia and a GORD uh, in another gastroenterology talk. There is some evidence to suggest the overlap of irritable bowel syndrome and dyspepsia with non-cardiac chest pain and fibromyalgia. And uh, fibromyalgia, for those of you who have met patients with fibromyalgia, can be quite a complex uh, constellation of symptoms and concerns about the patients. However, before we get to uh, the uh, syndrome of irritable bowel, it's important to make sure that you appreciate the more acute and serious causes of abdominal pain. The vast majority, as I was saying earlier, about 50% will be non-specific abdominal pain, such as uh, IBS or functional dyspepsia. But it's important to exclude the others. So, for example, acute appendicitis, cholecystitis, diverticulitis, small bowel obstruction, acute pancreatitis, upper gastrointestinal or duodenal perforation, ischemic bowel and perforated bowel. So, irritable bowel syndrome is a chronic relapsing and often lifelong disorder, um, often will cause abdominal pain or discomfort. It may be associated with defecation and or a change in bowel habit. Symptoms will often include disordered defecation, so patients get um, significant amounts of diarrhoea or constipation or they get a mix. So what do I mean by that? Well, some patients will often have cycles um, where they'll get periods where they'll get predominantly diarrhoea um, and then they'll get predominantly constipation for a while and swap over. As I say, there is sometimes an overlap with other GI disorders such as non-ulcerative dyspepsia or celiac disease. Um, and as I was saying, you can have a diarrhea predominant profile or constipation uh, predominant profile. So when we look at the epidemiology of these diseases, so they mostly affect um, ages between 20 and 30. They are twice as common in women than men, and the prevalence is about 10 to 20 percent in the United Kingdom. Now, there is increasing evidence of IBS in older people. Um, but this has to be balanced by uh, the possibility or presence of red flag symptoms. So when we're taking a history in these patients, we have to be really careful, uh, particularly in the older age group, before putting it down to IBS. In younger people, assuming that there's no strong genetic history of colonic cancers uh, or hereditary polyposis, then uh, you can usually get to a diagnosis of IBS a lot easier in the younger age group compared to the older. So what are the red flags, i.e. Um, signs that you should refer your patient for suspected cancer under the two-week wait rule? Uh, I've listed all these in red. So they are age of greater than 40 uh, with unexplained weight loss and abdominal pain, or they are aged 50 and above with unexplained, and I'll come on to what that means in a moment, rectal bleeding, or they are aged greater than 60 with iron deficiency anemia or a change in bowel habit. And again, I'll come to the definition of iron deficiency anemia in a moment. 
or tests show occult blood in their feces. Uh, consider if age less than 50 with rectal bleeding and unexplained abdominal pain, change in bowel habit, weight loss or iron deficiency anemia. So just to give you a definition of unexplained and that are according to NICE which is the National Institute of Care Excellence they are symptoms or signs that have not led to a diagnosis being made by the healthcare professional in primary care after initial assessment which includes a history examination and any primary care investigations. The suspected cancer pathway referral means that the patient is seen within the national target for cancer referrals which is two weeks. A uh, iron deficiency anemia are those that have a low MCB and a HB that's below the normal guidelines for male and female. So considering IBS, you look at the ABC criteria, at least six months of any of the following abdominal pain or discomfort, bloating or change in bowel habit. So IBS should only be considered only if the person has abdominal pain or discomfort that is either relieved by defecation or associated with altered bowel habit, freak, uh, sorry, altered bowel frequency or stool form. This should be accompanied by at least two of the following four. Altered stool passage, such as straining, urgency, incomplete evacuation, uh, abdominal bloating, which is more common in women. Now you'll notice that I've put an asterisk star by women. It's really important to remember that what age of the female uh, that you're examining. So for example, if you had a woman who was say over the 45 uh, and who had symptoms of abdominal bloating, distension or hardness, it would be really also important to consider which malignancy? Ovarian, okay? So very often when patients have uh, ovarian malignancy, very often it's these sort of non-specific symptoms. So you may well see this in IBS, but certainly women, um, you should always certainly consider about whether this is um, ovarian cancer or not. Symptoms made worse by eating and of course passage of mucus. So some patients also get these other symptoms, lethargy, nausea, backache and bladder symptoms. Now again, you want to make sure that you understand the context and the history really importantly. So lethargy would be seen with anemia, nausea might be seen by um, a tumour uh, causing obstruction and delay in um, food transition. Backache, of course, you might see in, say, metastatic prostate cancer, for example, uh, infiltrating malignancy. Bladder symptoms, again, should make you prompt to um, explore those in full and make sure you're not missing, for example, bladder cancer from hematuria or locally invasive vagina, uh, vaginal or cervical cancer. The initial investigation profile are full blood counts. So again, this is courses to look for anemia. ESR and CRP obviously look for inflammatory diseases. So if you have elevated ESR and or CRP in the context of the IBS symptoms, then you're probably looking for an inflammatory bowel disease and you might want to consider doing a faecal cow protecting test and referring to gastroenterology uh, from the acute medicine unit for a second opinion and performing uh, an endoscopic procedure. You may also wish to send antibody testing for celiac disease, so endomysial antibodies or tissue uh, transglutaminase or TTG antibodies. So investigations are not necessary if IBS criteria are met. And again, it's important to make sure that you have a clear idea in your minds about what the IBS criteria are and that you're happy that there aren't any red flags or any likelihood of uh, a different pathology such as ovarian malignancy in women. So you may want to consider ultrasound, rigid, flexible sigmoidoscopy, colonoscopy or barium enemas, TFTs, faecal ova and parasitology tests, faecal occult blood and hydrogen breath test, which is used for lactose intolerance and bacterial overgrowth. If you're considering any of these investigations and you should be reconsidering your diagnosis. As I said earlier, these tests were previously done to, uh, to diagnose IBS uh, as a diagnosis of exclusion, but that's no longer necessary if the criteria are carefully applied. So diet. So first of all, patients usually need to reduce their fibre intake. Often people who have IBS have this perception that they need to increase their fibre intake, not reduce it. Um, certainly any changes in their fibre intake, patients should be actively encouraged to 
uh, monitor the effect of the dietary change. Um, you'll notice that I have crossed out the Kellogg's Bran Flakes, um, so you want to discourage uh, patients from eating insoluble fibre such as bran. Um, if an increase in dietary fibre is needed, then I suggest ispagula powder or oats, as these are high in soluble fibre. So what is the perfect poo? Well, actually, if you look at the Bristol stool chart, you'll notice that I've circled type 4 stool, and this is the ideal stool for someone to have. You'll notice that type 1, for example, are very constipated, um, rabbit droppings, if you to were to be crude about it, someone's they've put on there like nuts. Um, and then at the other end, you have type 7 stool, so sometimes we see this in infective diarrhea, such as cholera, shigella, campylobacter, uh, C. diff, are type 6 and 7, which are either fluffy pieces with a ragged edge, or very mushy, or type 7, which is entirely water. Um, and certainly if you see type 7 stool in hospital, you should be considering about whether this patient has C. difficile. So pharmacological therapy, so what you're basically asking your patients to do is to self-manage their IBS as much as they can. So, for example, if they have uh, pro-constipated cycles, um, they want to take laxatives as necessary and titrate them accordingly. So you want to start them with something gentle, such as Senna. I'd strongly avoid prescribing patients lactulose. It can often cause stomach cramps and it can actually worsen bloating and make the, feel patient, make the patient feel quite uncomfortable. You may want an anti-motility agent, and the first line that NICE recommends is lipiramide. Um, you may suggest an over-the-counter antispasmodic such as buscopan. Um, I have to say evidence for the random controlled trials looking at buscopan in um, IBS is relatively weak. Uh, as are things like peppermint tea and so on. If, if I remember rightly, peppermint tea does better than buscopan. Uh, you may want to consider tricyclic antidepressants as a second line if the above agents don't help. Um, you want to start at 5 to 10 milligrams of amitriptyline or amitriptyline equivalents uh, once a day at night. Review regularly and increase up to a usual maximum of 30 milligrams. You'll note there that I've put this as an off-label use for uh, amitriptyline, so GMC guidance applies, i.e. that it's in the patient's best interest and that you have considered alternatives. So dietary advice, you want to have regular meals, take time to eat, avoid missing meals or long gaps between meals, reduce tea and coffee to three cups a day, reduce alcohol and fizzy drinks. It may be helpful to limit the intake of high fibre food, reduce intake of resistant starch, so these are often found in processed or recooked foods. If there is diarrhoea, you want to avoid sorbitol. This is an artificial sweetener that's often seen in chewing gum and sugar-free foods. You want to discourage um, supplements such as aloe vera, as nice as it is to drink, acup acupuncture and reflexology. Again, the data being uh, significantly lacking for acupuncture, reflexology or aloe vera. Um, so my reference text today, we're Irritable Bowel Syndrome in Adults Diagnosis and Management, www.nice.org.uk slash guidance CG61. And a textbook was Gastroenterology and Liver Disease by editors Long and Scott by Sylvia Mosby from 2005. Thank you very much for listening. I'll speak to you soon. Bye bye.